and we'd like to welcome everyone tonight um, to our presentation on Let's Talk Tomatoes and Peppers. Um, we'll have a few more joining us probably throughout the night, Ken, uh, but we appreciate that you come out. This is, um, so our unit is, uh, that serves uh, for the Illinois Extension and we serve Bonn, Clinton, Jefferson, Marion and Washington counties. And I'd like to introduce uh, Kathy Kingsley, who's going to be our master gardener, to introduce Ken tonight. So I'm going to switch this over to her, and she's going to give an introduction tonight real quick. And I apologize, we're, we're having some technical. So thank you, Chris. OK. So um, I'd like to introduce uh, Ken Johnson. I've watched him on video and on Zoom classes and and other programs and always learn uh, quite a bit from them. Okay, Ken is the horticulture educator serving Calhoun, Cass, Green, Morgan, and Scott counties. His educational efforts focus on fruits and, and vegetable productions, pest management, and beneficial insects. Throughout his programming efforts, he aims to increase background food production backyard food production and foster a greater appreciation of insects. He is one of the authors of Good Growing Blog and one of the Good Growing Podcast. Welcome, Ken, to our program. Thank you for having me. Um, <clears throat> so like they've mentioned, we're going to talk about tomatoes and peppers, um, primarily tomatoes, but a lot of this is still going to apply um, two peppers. So go ahead and get started here. Um, and if you have any questions as we're going along, uh, feel free to put those in the chat box and we can get to those at the end. Uh, just to start, um, we'll talk a little bit about um, training tomatoes. Um, not going to go into too much detail because hopefully you've done that already and it may be getting a little too late depending on the size of your plants to do this. Um, <clears throat> I think we're going to we'll talk about this a little more at the end uh, with some of the master gardeners as well. Um, but when it comes to tomato plants and even peppers, um, training them is, is commonly done. So we can do our staking or caging. So on the left there, we have our staking tomatoes. So typically, uh, those stakes are put into the ground um, when those plants are planted. That way, you don't disturb the root system too much. Um, those stakes need to be tall enough to support those plants. So they may need to be uh, six, seven feet above the ground, driven into the ground another foot. So you're probably looking at probably a minimum eight foot uh, piece of wood uh, to do this and then you're just going to tie those up there. Typically this is done when you're doing this you're going to do a lot of pruning uh, to those tomatoes. You're going to prune off all those suckers. Um, caging this is can also be done for tomatoes and, and peppers as well. Uh, peppers don't need the support quite as much um, as tomatoes. Peppers can support themselves a little bit better. They get um, a little more woody as they grow throughout the season compared to tomatoes. Uh, but with caging you can do I like the cages on the left there, the stuff they have at the hardware stores and nurseries. Uh, those are good for smaller determinate types. Uh, if you're growing larger indeterminate tomatoes, so those tomatoes that will keep growing throughout the year, uh, you're probably going to need something a little bit bigger than those, the ones you can buy in the store. A lot of people will use uh, concrete reinforcing wire and make their own cages with that because those plants can get rather large uh, throughout the growing year. Um, and then a kind of a hybrid between staking and caging is a, a weave. That's that middle picture there. So you'll have stakes every few plants, and then you're gonna weave um, some kind of string, um, twine, yarn, something in between those plants to support them. Um, and you're gonna do that every six inches or so up that up those stakes. So if you haven't done um, any kind of support for your plants, you can grow them on the ground, but they do get, you do need a lot of room for that. And you do tend to have more uh, disease issues if you just kind of let them sprawl along the ground. Um, so I get, talked about a lot of this already. So staking, um, a lot of times when we're staking tomatoes, we're gonna get bigger fruits and earlier ripening because we are pruning uh, off those suckers. One of the, the drawbacks of this is you get uh, less yield because you have less plant material there to produce uh, uh, tomatoes for you. And you do tend to get more sun scald because you are pruning and exposing those fruit to the sun. Again, stakes at least seven feet tall. Um, and they need to be in the ground at least a foot to support these plants because at the end of the year, these tomato plants can get quite large and be quite heavy. So you need that stake secured in the ground fairly well. Uh, you wanna do a figure eight when you are tying 
those plants up, you want to use a soft cloth. You don't want to use something like string that's going to cut into the plant like that bottom there. Uh, what I use is I use old t-shirts, just cut those up into strips and use those to tie up uh, our tomatoes when we stake them as well. And typically when doing this, you're going to have one stem per plant. You're just going to stake, uh, train that up that stake. Uh, you can do multiple stakes per plant and allow uh, multiple stems per plant, but that just gets a little more complicated, um, but it can be done. Again, caging um, typically is, is more productive. You get more fruit off of it, but the fruits tend to be a little bit smaller um, and, and they ripen later because uh, you have more fruit on there. All that energy is being split between more fruits, so they, they're smaller. Um, and, and the plant's putting on more um, leaf material, so it kind of delays blooming and, and fruit production a little bit. So it kind of pushes that ripening and harvest back uh, a little bit compared to staking when you're pruning a lot. Caging, typically, you're not going to be pruning those tomatoes too much. Uh, again, like I mentioned before, you can buy these, these colorful ones at the top there in garden centers and stuff, but they're better for the smaller determinant types. Using that concrete reinforcement wire, that's that, or the mesh, that's that bottom picture there. You can create much larger cages that way. Um, again, those are better for the the larger indeterminate types because uh, they can get quite large. And again, you need to put these into the ground eight to 12 inches deep. Uh, if you're making your own cage, like on the bottom there, you may need to drive some stakes into those to help support uh, those, those larger cages and larger plants. Uh, I've mentioned pruning um, several times. I think there's gonna be a, a demonstration at the end here on how to do that. So I won't go into too much, too much detail on how to do that. Um, but pruning is, is gonna be a little more critical for indeterminate than determinate species. Um, and a lot of this is just personal preference um, as well. Some people like pruning their plants, others don't really care. So there's not necessarily a right or wrong way to go about pruning. Uh, typically though, with determinate plants, you're gonna prune up to that first fruit cluster and then stop and then let any other suckers that are being developed um, continue to grow. Indeterminate, especially if you are staking your plants, you wanna prune all those suckers off. So you have basically one long vine um, on the plant. If you are growing um, indeterminate plants about a month before our first frost is expected, so depending on where you are in the state, um, sometime in, in September or October, um, you can go in and top those plants, remove the, the top growth, um, and this is going to slow the growth of the plant and it's going to kind of force the plant to put more of its resources into developing fruit, um, so it may speed up that process so you can get a few more ripe tomatoes before that first frost instead of having a bunch of green ones on your plants still. When it comes to just kind of general care for tomatoes, uh, mulching is, is highly recommended. Uh, mulching is gonna help with uh, retaining some of that soil moisture, keep the soils a little bit cooler, uh, can help prevent diseases from splashing up onto your plants. And we'll, we'll talk about all that a little bit later. So if you don't mulch your, your tomatoes, I would recommend doing that. You can use um, organic mulches like they have here on the left. So wood chips, um, I use shredded leaves uh, that I, they rake up in the fall and I just store them in my garage and then use them in the, during the summer. Uh, you can use straw, stuff like that. You can also use um, black plastic, um, landscape fabric, stuff like that, cut holes in it, uh, kind of like they've done on the right of that picture, that black area. Either way, that both of those are gonna help retain some of that soil moisture and prevent um, water splash from the soil onto plants. Uh, if you are growing your tomatoes in pots, uh, again, water is, watering is going to be important regardless of where they're growing, but if they're in pots or in containers, you're going to need to water those plants more often, um, maybe daily, maybe even more often than that, depending on how hot and humid and the size of the plants and the size of the pot. Um, but I've heard of people having to water their tomatoes two or three times a day um, when it gets real hot. So and you want to make sure you're, you, you are consistently watering that, that soil moisture. The soil is kind of consistently moist. When we start getting that soil, flux, that soil moisture fluctuation, that can cause some issues with uh, fruit development um, as well. And when those, those tomatoes start putting fruit, uh, fruit on the plants, uh, moisture is going to become real essential because when you think about tomato, there's a lot of moisture in there. Um, and, and if we have some moisture deficits, that can cause issues with with those developing fruit. When it comes to harvesting tomatoes, um, tomatoes kind of go through, uh, we'll go through a couple different growth stages when they're producing the fruit. So basically those fruit will grow until they reach their full size, their mature size. So this is the mature green stage when they are fully grown, um, then they will start to develop their color. 
Um, so once they have reached that full size, you can you can kind of pick those tomatoes at any time. You can ripen them in, ripen them indoors if you want, or leave them on the vine and let them ripen uh, on the plant. Optimum temperature is between 68 and 77 degrees. When you think about our summer temperatures, um, we don't really have that all that often. Um, and if we get really, if we get a little bit warmer, temperatures above 86, um, the red coloring um, is kind of inhibited. That those pigments that cause that red coloring don't um, don't really develop all that well. So you don't get that nice red color on, on tomatoes. So when you think about a lot of times when it gets real hot, um, July, August, you know, there's kind of a lull in the fruit. And then when we start cooling off in the fall, a lot of times there's a kind of another big flush um, of fruit on there because temperatures cool off a little bit. Um, again, for, uh, for best flavor, um, they should ripen on the vine. But again, once they're mature, at mature green stage, you can't pick those and ripen them indoors, 70 to 75 degrees. Um, and that's what a lot of people will do when frost um, is predicted. They'll pick any any fruit they have on there, and then they will ripen those indoors um, so they can have have those tomatoes. And if you have issues with with critters and stuff, that may be another option as well as pick them before um, the birds and whatnot get to them. When it comes to harvesting peppers, um, the the fruit of the peppers can be really can really be harvested anytime you want. Uh, typically, for bell peppers, uh, we'll pick them when they're fully mature typically three to four inches, and that can vary a little bit depending on uh, the variety, uh, but they're gonna be firm and green in color. Um, if there are some of the colored bell peppers, you know, red or yellow or, or purple, you wanna let them, typically you're gonna let them develop their color, uh, but you can still pick them when they're green. Um, one way to tell if they're ready is if you kind of twist the, the peppers up, they'll, they'll easily snap off from the plant. Um, that's, that's a pretty good indication that they're ready to pick. If they don't really come off real easily, um, they're, they're probably not fully mature. You can still pick them, uh, but if you do that, try to cut them off. You don't want to try to rip those off the plant um, and potentially break branches and stuff like that. If you're growing hot peppers, those are typically harvested at the red ripe stage. So again, when they start changing colors, and again, that'll depend on, on the variety you're growing. Um, one exception to that would be jalapenos. Typically, we don't pick those when they're red. When they start turning red, they will eventually turn red, but typically we're picking those um, when they're green, they're kind of that, that full size. And again, that can depend on the type of jalapeno you're growing. There are some uh, that can get rather large, you know, depending on the variety. Um, and if you are growing hot peppers, um, be careful when you are picking those. Um, you know, a lot of times it may be a good idea to wear gloves so you're not getting a, um, any of that capsaicin and stuff on your fingers and then rubbing your eyes or anything like that. Um, you don't want to get that stuff in your eyes. So exercise some caution uh, when harvesting those. Uh, so from here on out, we'll, we'll talk about some of the common pests um, that we get in tomatoes and peppers and how we can manage them. Um, but before we do that, this would not be a very good extension program if we didn't talk about IPM. Uh, so IPM or integrated pest management is just kind of an approach that we can take to controlling pests, whether that be insects, weeds, um, diseases, what have you. Uh, using environmentally and economically sound practices. Uh, so in a lot of cases, particularly with, with insects and, and weeds, some cases, we'll have a, a large pest population. We we'll use our IPM techniques and we'll get those, the, those pest populations down to a, to a more manageable level where they're not really causing noticeable damage or significant damage to those plants. We may not completely eliminate the pest, um, but they are not causing um, enough damage to those plants to really worry about. So there's a couple different techniques we'll use when doing this. So we'll use our cultural management. So basically we are trying to maintain uh, the plant's health. So this gets into the right plant at the right place at the right time. So making sure you're, you're waiting long enough in the year to put your tomatoes out. Um, here in Jacksonville, Central Illinois, that's usually mid-May when we want to do that. You plant a little bit earlier than that, there's still the chance for that frost that can come through and, and nip your plants and cause some damage to those. Uh, making sure you have proper fertility, so soil testing. Um, seeing if you need to fertilize, adjust pH, all of that stuff. Um, using resistant cultivars, that is very important for disease management, especially for uh, tomatoes to a lesser extent, peppers. Um, but if you get into uh, garden catalogs in the, in the early spring, late, late winter, early spring, when those start coming out, um, you know, look at, if you look at some of those abbreviations next to those cultivar names, um, and, and look for some disease resistant, resistant varieties, especially if you have 
had disease issues in the past. So for example, A would be alternaria, uh, that's early blight. F is fusarium, V is verticillium. So those different symbols next, those different abbreviations next to the cultivars will indicate what they're resistant to. Um, pruning, um, you know, help get airflow through the plants so you have less disease problems, good sanitation, um, removing diseased plant material, um, harvesting all the fruit off there, don't let that fruit stay on the plant and rot. Um, and then the introduce pathogens into your um, your plants. Again, mulching, help with that soil, moisture retention, suppress weeds, all of that fun stuff uh, as well. Our physical, we're trying to physically eliminate pests. So again, cultivating the soil to get rid of uh, of weeds or if you have issues with hornworms, um, oh my goodness, they will pupate in the ground and you can cultivate the soil um, to try to reduce those. Hand picking, and we get into the caterpillars, that can be a good option. Uh, pruning out diseased plant material. Uh, again, those barriers of that mulching prevent that water splash from spreading diseases from the soil, um, suppressing weeds, stuff like that. Um, and on the top there, that's not a tomato plant, but you can, you could net your plants if you have issues with birds and stuff like that, if you really wanted to. Uh, we also have biological control. So of this, we're managing pests with natural enemies. So not every insect you see in your garden is a bad one. Um, there are insects and other critters out there that will eat other insects and do some pest management for you. Um, so when you're out scouting your garden, I should have mentioned this earlier, um, going out and scouting is very important. So go out in your garden at least once a week, check out your plants, see what's going on out there. Um, the sooner you notice problems, the sooner, and the sooner you start taking steps to manage that, the easier it's going to be. If you let it kind of wait and, and get out of control, a lot of times there's not much you can do. Um, so we do have predators, so they will eat other insects. So the top there, that reddish mite, that is a predatory mite that'll feed on two spotted spider mite, um, which we can get on tomatoes and peppers occasionally. On the bottom there, we have ladybugs, lady beetles, both the adults and the larva will feed on insects like aphids and other uh, smaller things. And that the yellow cluster in between the larva and the beetle, those are the eggs. So again, if you see those larva or the eggs on there, and most people don't know what that stuff is, but if you see something like that, you wanna leave those on your plants. That's not something you need to control. Uh, and on the right there, on the bottom, that is an aphid line. That's a larva of a lacewing. Um, and you can see here, it feeds on aphids and again, other smaller uh, soft-bodied insects. We have our parasites and parasitoids. So on the top there, that is a hornworm caterpillar that has been parasitized. All those white things are the cocoons of the wasp that have eaten the inside of it. So again, if you see something like that in your garden, just leave that. You're gonna have hundreds of little wasps coming out. Uh, to attack other caterpillars. On the bottom right there, that is um, another parasitoid wasp. It is laying an egg inside of that aphid. Um, so again, the, those will manage aphids. And on the bottom left there, those little white things, those are nematodes that have gotten into that um, pupa of that butterfly or that moth and, and have killed it. So that stuff is gonna be in the soil. And there are also pathogens. So there are, just like humans and plants, insects can get diseases. So if we have, a lot of times when we have real wet um, weather or if it's humid, we can get some disease outbreaks um, in insects as well. And then there's always the chemical management. So this we're using pesticides to manage our pests, whether that be insecticides, herbicides, fungicides, um, what have you. Um, and with these, again, you want to make sure you read and follow all label directions. Wouldn't be a good, it wouldn't be a good extension program if I didn't mention that um, as well. Um, and you know. You can still use chemicals in your garden. It may not be the first thing you want to use, uh, but sometimes chemicals can be the best control option uh, for some of our pests. In most cases, maybe not, um, but sometimes it may be necessary to use chemicals to control some of the stuff. So some of the insects uh, that we commonly see in tomatoes and peppers. Uh, first off, we've got white flies. Um, these, from my experience, typically start showing up a little bit later in the year when we get um, nice and hot and humid. A lot of times, you know, late July, August is when I see the populations really kind of start taking off. Uh, typically, you'll find these on the undersides of the leaves. Both the wings and the body of the adults are covered in a, a powdery, waxy material that's white. That's how they get their names. Um, and if you get enough of these, if you disturb the plant, it can look like it's snowing if the populations get high enough. Um, and, and they have piercing, sucking mouth parts. So their mouth is kind of like a straw. We'll stick that into the plant and suck the plant juices out. So this can cause some yellowing of the leaves, can cause some distortion of the leaves. Um, so capable of transmitting some 
services as well. So for management of these, um, you do forceful water of spray to knock them off your plants. Um, near infested foliage, that'll catch some of them and also help you monitor uh, those populations. See if they're getting real high. Um, if they get real high, and if you have something like a situation like this where you're leaving, that's probably something where you're going to need to use some pesticides um, to manage. There are some natural enemies that will manage. So take a close look and see if you have any of these natural enemies in there before you start using uh, chemicals, though. Um, hornworms, if you've grown uh, tomatoes, you've probably seen these. These, will all, these can also get onto peppers, although not nearly as common as tomatoes, though. Um, when full grown, these can be about three inches long. These are green caterpillars. Uh, we do have, do have two different types, our tobacco hornworm and our tomato hornworm. Uh, so the tobacco hornworm is what people typically see. It's got the seven diagonal line, white lines on the body and a red horn on the hind end, uh, whereas the tomato hornworm has eight uh, V-shaped or chevron marks on the sides and it has a, a bluish blackish horn. It doesn't really matter which one you have. They're both gonna eat your plants. Um, they, can, they can do some significant damage on the plants when they get fully mature. Um, so with these, again, this is another one going out scouting. If you see them, hand pick them, um, just pick them off your plants. Um, I have read um, that you, you can eat them and you, when you cook them, they taste kind of like a fried green tomato. Um, I have never done this. I, I've never really had any issues with them, but someday if I get some, I, I will try that and I can report back later. But that is an option. Um, you could try to eat them. If you were spraying pesticides in your garden, I wouldn't do that. But if you haven't been spraying anything, um, that is an option. Um, and again, like we mentioned earlier um, with parasitoids, that middle picture there, if you see a caterpillar like this with all of those pupa on there, all those cocoons, uh, just leave that in the garden. That, that particular insect is not going to be feeding anymore, and you're going to have all kinds of wasps coming off of that that will go out and, and attack other uh, hornworms for you and, and get those under control. Uh, if you are noticing a lot of your foliage missing and you're seeing a lot of frass or insect poop, um, these can be kind of hard to see. Uh, you can go outside at night with a black light and these will kind of fluoresce a little bit. So that's another way you could potentially find these as well if you have a black light. Um, and then you can use insecticides for those as well. Something like a, um, a BTK, uh, which is Bacillus thuringiensis cristachii. That is specific to caterpillars, so you don't have to worry about that affecting you know, pollinators, natural enemies, stuff like that. But that only affects uh, caterpillars. We also have our tomato fruit worm. Um, and if you grow uh, corn, you know this is corn earworm, same insect, just different name depending on what it's eating. Uh, so larva can be green to reddish to brownish in color. So you can see there's a wide uh, range of, of coloration there. Those caterpillars, those are all uh, the same species right there, uh, but they do have stripes. Um, on their bodies um, as well. That's kind of the one, one thing that holds consistent is the stripes on the bodies. Um, they will burrow and into and consume the fruit of both tomatoes um, and peppers. Uh, personally, I've never had any issues with them on peppers, but I have had uh, problems with, with tomatoes. Um, typically, they'll start off at the top of the fruit near the base of the, um, base of the stem and burrow their way in, kind of like that bottom picture there. Uh, that caterpillar has gone into that fruit, eaten the inside. And then you can see at the bottom, it's, it's exited um, again. Um, when you cut open, there's a lot of tunneling in there. Um, again, the frass or the insect poop will be in there. Um, this also opens up a hole where decay pathogens, um, diseases can get in there and start breaking that fruit down. Um, so not necessarily a good situation, um, but in a lot of cases, typically they, they damage less than 5% of the crop. Um, and they're more of an issue in late maturing uh, tomatoes than they are in, in earlier in the year. Um, and I don't know about you, but typically when we start getting into late August, September, I'm kind of done picking tomatoes. So if I lose a few tomatoes here and there, it doesn't really bother me too much. It's less I have to pick. Um, so in a lot of cases, you may not need to control much because they're not doing a tremendous amount of damage. If you've got a lot of them, or if you've had a lot of issues in the past, um, then again, that may be something where um, you may need to spray uh, for these as well. Uh, so those are kind of the big insect uh, pests. There's other out there, others out there, aphids and stuff, but those are kind of the, the primary ones we see in tomatoes and peppers, at least here in Illinois. Uh, some of the diseases that can cause some issues. So we've got fusarium, 
Um, and verticillium wilt, this is again, primarily a, an issue with um, tomatoes, but you can get it in peppers and all, all of these diseases, primarily tomatoes, but they can also cause problems in, in peppers occasionally. So these are lower older leaves, uh, will start to turn yellow and wilt. So you can see that top picture there, that's kind of that yellowing. Um, and then the middle picture there, you can see some of those leaves have started to die and that plant is starting to wilt. Um, and then the bottom picture that it's kind of progressed um, uh, and kind of the, eventually that whole plant um, may die. Uh, initially, that wilting may only occur during stress. So you kind of see it during the heat of the day and the plants kind of perk up at night when it starts to cool off. Um, but again, over time, it, it, that wilting will last longer and longer before those plants will eventually die. Um, and this thing is something that can survive in the soil for years. So this is one where crop rotation um, is going to be important. Um, you know, you don't want to grow, ideally don't grow potatoes, tomatoes, peppers, all those solanaceous crops, eggplants in the same area year after year, you want to rotate, um, take at least one year, ideally two to three years off in between growing them in the same area. Um, and with home gardens, that's a lot of times that's easier said than done, but try to get them as far as, far away as possible from where you've grown them previously, ideally. Um, when you, if you have a plant that's wilting and you, and you suspect this may be it, um, you know, snap off a stem and a lot of times you'll have that brown streaking, that, in, that internal discoloration um, because of the diseases in this, like this picture right here. Um, so that's a pretty good indication you have um, one of these wilt pathogens there. Uh, so again, for management, if you have issues with this in the past, you wanna look for resistant varieties. Again, that good crop rotation, um, avoid wet spots because this stuff is surviving in the soil. You have area where water kind of pools that will kind of spread the pathogens down into that area. Um, and if you do have diseased plants, you wanna pull those plants, get as much of that plant, that root system out as possible um, and, and put that out, out in the yard waste. Don't try to compost those plants. More than like, most residential composters do not get their compost high enough to kill pathogens. So you're better off um, putting that out with the yard waste or burning it um, if you can. Um, early blight, um, this is another pretty common disease, foliar disease that we get on plants, on our, our tomatoes. And again, we can get it on peppers occasionally as well. Uh, leaf spots are kind of round um, and they have a, the, this target pattern, and this, these concentric rings. Um, you can see it on that stem and on the leaves as well. And again, typically like a lot of our or foliar diseases, they'll start off at the ground um, and kind of work their way up. This can overwinter in the soil. So as we get rain, that rain splashes on the soil, that soil kind of splashes up onto the leaves. There may be some spores of this pathogen on there. That's how they get to the leaf, those bottom leaves, and they just kind of work their way up uh, the plant. Uh, can also get on the fruit as well. Um, and you kind of get these um, leathery black spots um, on the fruit um, as well. And infected fruit may drop from the plant and, and it allows you know, entry for other pathogens to get into the fruit um, and start rotting as well. Uh, late blight, like another pathogen. This is re a really big problem in potatoes. This is the pathogen that causes the Irish potato famine, um, but potatoes and tomatoes are, are related. So it, it can also be an issue in tomatoes. Um, Again, it can cause these leaf spots like on the top there. Uh, the spots typically have a gray green edge and they can rapidly expand and the whole leaf or the whole plant can become necrotic where it will die uh, like that bottom picture there. And those fruits can also be infected. So that bottom picture, uh, that fruit in the middle there, you can also see uh, what that infection looks like. So kind of that, that kind of greenish brown uh, coloration to those fruit um, as well. And then we have septoria leaf uh, spot. Um, this is probably what I see most common, um, at least in my garden. Um, and a lot of the stuff that, that's brought into our office is septoria leaf spot. Um, again, typically starts at the lower part of the plant. Uh, the spots are, are small, circular, about a 16th to a quarter of an inch in size. Uh, they have dark brown margins, margins and tan to gray centers. And the bottom picture there, if you look real closely, sometimes you can see these little uh, pustules almost like pimples. Um, that's a pretty good indication you have this and that those are gonna, going to be releasing spores. Um, so that's getting ready to release spores that will spread by rain splash uh, and stuff like that. Uh, and again, you can get, can get quite a few spots on the leaves and 
and that can cause um, leaves to drop uh, and stuff like that. Uh, there is also anthracnose. This is primarily an issue on uh, the fruits. So we get these circular um, sunken lesions, sunken spots on the fruits. So the, on the top there, that tomato on the right, that's kind of that initial um, infection there. And then over time, um, you often get these pink or orange masses um, on there as again, as they're starting to produce spores. On the bottom there, that's pepper. Um, this, I, I see this quite a bit um, in pepper um, and thracnose on there. That's probably the biggest disease. Most common disease I've seen in pepper is, is gonna be in thracnose. Um, and again, it's primarily uh, fruit disease, but you can get it in the leaves and stems um, occasionally. Um, and it is different species, as far as I can, as from what I've read, they are two different species affecting tomatoes and peppers um, of the pathogen. So when it comes to these foliar diseases, some of the different things we can do, um, again, resistant um, is important um, for the, the kind of the three big um, tomato diseases we have, that late blight, early blight, um, and septoria leaf spot. Um, they have developed some cultivars or some varieties that are resistant uh, to all three of those. Um, one of those um, would be, um, oh, I'm drawing a blank on the name here. Um, Iron Lady um, is one of those. I think Brandy, I think it's Brandy Wise is another one that is resistant to all three of those. So if you have issues with all three of those uh, particular pathogens, those may be some cultivars to look for. Uh, again, that crop rotation, ideally two to four years in between growing tomatoes, potatoes, peppers, eggplants in the same spot. Again, I realize that's easier said than done a lot of times. Um, making sure you have disease-free plants so don't bring problems home when you're buying them. Good air circulation, so proper plant spacing, pruning plants um, as well. Water in the morning, um, that way you give more time for those plants to dry off. Uh, again, mulching, like I mentioned, a lot of these will overwinter uh, in the soil. So if you put that mulch down, it'll prevent some of that splashing um, or help reduce some of that splashing, uh, those pathogens on the leaves early in the year. Uh, don't go into the garden if, the, if your plants are wet, if they have any of these um, diseases on there and those plants are wet and you start touching them, you can spread these pathogens from plant to plant. Um, remove and destroy infected plants or infected leaves and stuff like that. Get those out of the garden so they're not uh, potentially spreading it. And then if you have you know, a lot of issues, you can always go with the fungicide route as well. Um, and like I mentioned um, earlier, uh, the label is the law. So make sure you're reading the labels um, and following all those directions. Since you would be applying these to crops you're going to eat, make sure you look at that pre-harvest interval. Um, and that's basically how long you have to wait once you spray before you can harvest and consume those fruit. So make sure you are following that. Um, that gives that those pesticides time to break down so they are safe. So those fruit are safe to eat. Uh, just a few other um, issues we can have. So blossom end rot, this is probably one of the more common issues we have in, in tomatoes. You can also get it in, in peppers. That's the bottom picture there. Um, this is not actually a disease. A um, couple of schools of thought as to what it is. Uh, traditionally been thought to be uh, low, cal low levels of calcium in the fruit, calcium deficiency. Um, some of the more, the newer research is showing it's, it's more just caused by stress. Um, so you can see that top picture there, that red tomato, uh, kind of that tan area, that's kind of the early stages of loss of men rot. And then it kind of, as time goes on, it becomes kind of leathery. It's always on the bottom of that fruit where that flower, you get a lot of times where that flower is the opposite end of the stem. Um, so some of the things that can cause this stress is, you know, uneven watering, real hot temperatures, uh, stuff like that. So when it comes to managing blossom end rot, uh, one thing you want to do is avoid um, really excessive fertilization, um, especially ammonium. Um, that can cause um, issues with nutrient uptake with some of the other nutrients. Um, you want to, again, provide that adequate moisture from fruit formation to maturity. So again, mulch can help with that, retain some of that soil moisture. Um, there are varieties that are less prone to developing blossom end rot, and these are just a few examples. Uh, Celebrity Mountain Pride, and I have never heard of cherry tomatoes having issues with blossom end rot. A lot of times it is an issue with um, large fruited varieties, is, is typically what you see it more often in. Um, you can also do a soil test to see if your soil is deficient in calcium, um, and, and then make any amendments to the soil. Uh, a lot of the foliar applications of calcium don't really help that much because the calcium does not move 
all that much um, in the plant when it's applied um, to the leaves and stuff. But consistent moisture is going to be the most important and probably easiest way um, to manage that in your landscape or in your gardens. Uh, sun scald can also be an issue with both tomatoes and peppers. This is typically happens when the fruit are exposed to direct sun, particularly in hot weather. So this could be you got a little, um, little did a little too much pruning and now those fruit were kind of developing in the shade. Now they're exposed to sun. It could be because you have disease issues and you've lost some of that foliage that was protecting that. Uh, so the big thing is, is kind of protecting that foliage so those, those fruit aren't exposed uh, to direct sun. Uh, cat facing is another common problem. We kind of get these misshapen fruits. They have scars or holes at the bottom of the fruit, and you can see that on the pictures there. Um, several different things can cause this um, abnormal development of the flower. So we have cool temperatures um, can cause this. Um, if there's any kind of growth regulator, herbicides. So if you're spraying your lawn to control broadleaf weeds, um, tomatoes are, are sensitive to a lot of the chemicals um, that are used. Um, in those like 2,4-D dicamba tomatoes are very sensitive to those and that can co potentially cause this as well. Um, variety choice can get into this. So again, a lot of your large beefsteak type tomatoes um, are, are kind of more prone to cat facing uh, than more the, the more rounded types uh, as well. And a lot of the heirlooms, um, it's, it's fairly common um, as well. Um, so there's not, a lot of times there's not a whole lot um, you can do with cat facing. A lot of times it just comes down to the variety um, and the weather, and there's really not much you can do about either of those. Uh, yellow shoulder, so this is where the top of that fruit does not kind of fully ripen or fully develop, so it stays yellow. Uh, it's kind of hard when you cut it open, that inside the internal tissue is, is still kind of white. Uh, a lot of times this uh, happens because you have low potassium levels in the soil um, and a high pH, or low organic matter. So again, soil testing, uh, if you have issues with this to see if that may potentially be an issue. It can also be caused by high temperatures. Um, again, when it gets real warm, those red, red pigments don't develop in the fruit anymore, so that can cause that as well. So again, reducing those fruits exposure to the sun can help with this as well, kind of keeping them a little bit cooler um, because of the foliage, just shading them. But again, if it gets real hot, there's not much you can do about that. Uh, cracking uh, can also be an issue, especially you know, depending on where you are in the state. Uh, we've had a lot of rain. Um, recently. So if you have tomatoes, you could be seeing some cracking. Uh, basically, it, it happens when those fruits start growing real fast. And basically, the skin can't keep up with it, the, the, the fruit growing, and they just kind of crack. Uh, a lot of times, it's when they're exposed to hot sun, um, they tend to crack more. Or when you get, it's been dry, and you get a lot of rain or irrigation, all of a sudden, uh, they'll crack. So maintaining that consistent soil moisture uh, can help uh, prevent some of this too. Again, some varieties are a little more prone to this uh, than others. So a variety selection can come into play. Uh, again, that healthy foliage, shade the, the fruit, uh, keep those temperature down as well. And if you have a lot of problems with this, again, you can harvest those when they're at their, that mature green stage, harvest that and let them ripen indoors to try to prevent uh, some cracking as well. Uh, wildlife can also be an issue. I have major problems with squirrels in my garden. Uh, and it always seems to be they, they'll get to the fruit right as they're about ripe. Um, you know, commonly I'll go out and think, yeah, these about have about another day or two. I go out and the tomato, the, the squirrels have eaten them. A lot of times they'll just take one or two bites and they move on to the next fruit. Um, with birds, it um, looks, because with their beaks, they'll kind of peck at them. So it looks like the, the fruit has been stabbed. Uh, so that tomato uh, on the top there with those two holes there, that's probably bird damage. Um, it looks kind of like they're stabbed, whereas the tomato on the left there, that's probably um, some squirrel damage where they've chewed holes in it. Um, again, there's a lot of times there's not a whole lot you can do about that. Um, I have tried um, netting my plants. I put uh, plastic grocery bags over them, uh, over the clusters, try to keep squirrels and stuff off there. Problem with that is moisture gets in there um, and you get a lot of disease problems and they start to rot. Um, so. That and being maybe another case where you pick them when they're green or starting to get some color and ripen them indoors um, so you can get them before uh, the critters do. Um, and then failure to ripen um, again can cause be caused by several different issues. So, temperatures below 60 degrees or above 90 degrees can um, 
can kind of slow that ripening process or prevent it altogether. Um, so again, there's not much you can do about the weather. You just kind of have to wait till that gets better. Uh, if you have really compacted soil or really wet soil, um, that can cause issues with ripening. So um, that may be putting boards down in your garden so you can walk on those so you're not compacting the soil. You may need to till or use uh, cover crops or something like that to, to loosen up that soil as well. Now again, low, low potassium levels uh, like within that yellow shoulder can cause um, fruit not to ripen properly. So again, making sure uh, your soil testing and if you have, but you wanna to put too much in the soil because you have issues with calcium and magnesium. So there's kind of a fine line there on how much potassium you want in your soils. Um, and that could be normal for the cultivar. Some tomatoes stay yellow, some will stay green when they're mature. So know what your tomatoes are supposed to look like um, when you're growing them too. Um, and then uh, last year, we've got no fruit. Uh, so tomatoes are self-pollinating, um, but they do need some kind of movement in order to release the pollen. Um, honeybees do not do a very good job of, of pollinating uh, tomatoes. They don't do buzz pollination. Uh, so these flowers have to be vibrated, stuff like bumblebees. When they come up to them, they will vibrate those flowers and that will release the pollen. Uh, wind blowing on them can also help um, with that as well. Uh, again, temperature, too hot, too cold. Uh, you kind of have to have that little Goldilocks zone um, for this. So if it gets, if temperatures at night are above 72 degrees, uh, the, the development of pollen um, can be affected there. So you may not get pollination because of that. Temperatures are above 85 degrees and during the day and 72 degrees at night, the plants may start dropping flowers. So again, there's not much you can do about when it's too hot. Um, if night temperatures get below 55 degrees, the flowers can drop. So just kind of be aware what the, temp the temperatures are like, and that could explain why you're not getting fruit where you have gaps um, when the fruit's coming in. Um, and then humidity, uh, same thing, too much, too little can cause issues. It's too low. Um, if it's below 40% or above 70%, uh, again, it can cause some issues with uh, the fertilization of those flowers. So again, you just kind of have to wait until more favorable weather uh, comes back. Um, so with that, um, we're gonna do some questions here um, next, but here's my contact information. If you have any questions you think of later, um, you know, feel free to send me an email. Um, I mentioned that some colleagues and I do a good growing blog, good growing podcast. So if you wanna check that out, those are um, the links uh, to those. And we do that weekly. And actually last, our podcast last week was on uh, growing tomatoes, if you wanna check that out. Um, and with that, we'll get to questions. Um, there, there is a QR code to the evaluation. So um, if you get a chance, um, snap a picture of that and go there, or um, I just put the link um, in the chat box too, if you could, if you wouldn't mind taking a moment and, and filling that out. Thank you, Ken. I have a couple questions. Do you wanna do those or do you want Kathy to go first, you tell me. Um, it doesn't make any difference to me, um, whatever you guys prefer. Okay, so we have two questions, or actually three. Maybe I'll have you answer those and then we'll have Kathy do a little demonstration of, uh, talking about her pruning of some tomatoes. Right. Sounds okay. good. So the first question was, can you define determinate and indeterminate, please? Uh, yeah, so determinate plants, um, basically those plants are going to stay smaller. Typically, they'll start growing. Um, they'll kind of reach their, their kind of their mature size, and then they will start flowering. Um, and they kind of set all their fruit basically at the same time. Uh, so you're going to get your big flush, flush of fruit, and then they're kind of done. Whereas indeterminate will continue to grow throughout the growing season, um, and they will continually put on uh, tomatoes. So determinate, you kind of have a little more concentrated um, harvest window, whereas indeterminate is more kind of all season. They'll keep producing up until um, we get a frost and those plants die. Okay, thank you. The next one was, please explain exactly what I should do to prune from the tomato plants. I take those that touch the ground and some suckers, but there are still too many leaves. Um, yeah, so so when I do pruning, I, I prune off um, 
the suckers. So basically those are the kind of the branch. So you have your main stem, you have your leaf coming out and then you have in between there in the axle, you'll have those suckers coming off. I will remove those. Um, and as the plants get larger, especially if I start getting some disease in there, I will start pruning off uh, the bottom leaves. Um, you know, and, and at least for me in, in my experience, you know, if you remove all those suckers, um, you just get a kind of a real long skinny plant and there's not a tremendous amount of foliage on there. Um, so maybe you could have just missed some of those suckers or it could be um, the cultivar you're growing too just produces a lot of foliage too. Okay, thank you. Uh, Denise asks, can you still eat tomatoes or peppers with arachnose? Um, I would not just because there is a potential for other, you know, you've got that opening, you could have some bacteria or other fungus getting in there that could cause um, issues. So, so in a lot of cases, it's better to be safe uh, than sorry. Um, and just, just dispose of those. You could try cutting it out, but um, you know, especially if you get any kind of internal decay in there, you're better off just getting rid of those fruit. Do you see any value in volunteer tomato plants? Um, sure, if they're not, you know, becoming weeds and causing problems. Um, depending on what you grew, if you grew one of the hybrid types, you're not going to get the same type of tomato off there. You may get something that's good. You may get something that's terrible. Uh, just kind of depend on the plant. Uh, if you're growing heirlooms, those will come back a little more true to form. Um, so I mean, that is a potential. It just kind of depends on on what you're growing. If it's going to be, you, you may not know if it's what you're going to get. Uh, if you're growing hybrids, it may it may be something that's worthwhile. It may not be. Um, I typically, I, in my garden, I, I pull any volunteers I get because I've, you know, I've got certain areas where I want to grow them, and a lot of times, you know, they become kind of weeds. Uh, in the garden, but that a lot of times that just comes down to kind of a personal preference. You know, you may, you may end up with something cool. You may not. Okay. Thank you. The best size to grow tomatoes in, con in a container. Um, so if you're, if you're growing determinate plants, you can get away with smaller containers because those tend to be smaller, um, smaller plants. Um, you know, if you're growing a larger indeterminate type, I would say probably um, something like a, one of those plastic whiskey barrel containers would be a good size just because those plants can get um, so large. Um, I mean, you can grow them in, in a fairly small container. You're just going to have to water um, quite frequently if the plant gets real big and you may need to support um, that pot because if those plants could get top heavy. Um, but I would say probably... Um, you know, five gallon bucket, a lot of times people will grow them in those, just put some holes in there. Um, that's a pretty good size for, for tomato plants, kind of on, on the lower end. Okay, it says, would you recommend plant food fertilizer in container tomatoes and what is best? So for your container tomatoes tip, you should be, if you're growing a container, you should be using some kind of soilless potting mix, um, uh, potting soil so those those will need fertilizer because those are do not have very many nutrients in them and most of those when you buy them um, a lot of them will have some kind of slow release fertilizer in there um, so you would you probably wouldn't need to add any fertilizer um, just check that bag and see if it's got fertilizer in it um, already and if it doesn't yeah then you would you would want to add um, some kind of fertilizer whether that's you know one of them that's a lot of times it's the recommendation is just kind of like a 10 10 10 um, just kind of a balanced uh, fertilizer for that stuff okay and it says any plant that is a good companion plant for tomatoes um so i'll, I'll say for my garden i grow um, you know, we have like cosmos and a lot of our herbs, we let those go to flower. Um, we do that to draw in natural enemies. If that's what you're talking about, companion plants for like pest management. Um, I do that. So we have that for those floral resources for those natural enemies. Cause a lot of those adults, um, will feed on flowers, um, on the pollen and the nectar. Um, 
so that's what would we grow to kind of draw in some of those natural enemies you know as far as you know some of these you know you hear about you know marigolds will help you know with with pests and stuff a lot of cases that only work with like marigolds those have to be killed and kind of tilled into the ground and for that to work with nematodes um, a lot of the companion planting stuff doesn't really work all that well it's more you want to you want to provide some flowers to draw in those natural enemies, um, in my opinion, um, for help, help with those insect problems sometimes. Okay, thank you so much. Um, and then we have one more that says, kind of lead into our presentation by Karen, um, or for Kathy, I'm sorry, I said Karen here because I was reading names. Um, guidelines on how to ID suckers. And so do you want her to show some of hers or do you want to explain it, Ken, in a second? Um, I, you know, I can take a stab at it, but yeah, it's, it's probably a little better to see it actually like in pictures. Um, but basically you'll have that stem of that plant um, and you'll have your leaf coming off. Um, and then where that leaf and that stem meet is where the suckers are gonna come off in that, in that kind of that, that angle, that crotch right there. Um, and those are what you're gonna, those will produce kind of a new stem. That's what you wanna break off. If you've got pictures of that, it's probably a lot better than my explanation there. Okay, well, we're, we're going to go ahead and introduce Kathy Kingsley, and she's a Marion County Master Gardener, and we appreciate her. She's taken a few minutes to kind of show some pruning tips for you today, and I'm going to let her take over just a second, and then we'll, any additional questions you have, please put in the chat box, and Ken will stay on and kind of help us answer those, Okay. Good evening, everyone. Um, my name's Kathy, and the topic we're going to do today is the pruning tomatoes. Okay. Um, after reading and studying and um, just life experiences with tomatoes, uh, there are some, some things that I thought I'd share with you. Um, first of all, I feel that you need to determine what kind of tomato you have. Is it a determinant or is it in, in, indeterminate? That can be a tongue twister. Um, a determinate tomato grows a determined amount of, to, of tomatoes, of fruit. So if you get to pruning and you prune too much, you're going to limit the amount of fruit that you uh, could have gotten off of this plant. I'm not gonna focus so much on the determinant plants this evening, but I will focus on the indeterminant. These uh, indeterminate tomato plants, they may grow huge in the garden. Sometimes you go out into my yard when I have a tomato garden and the things can be five foot high and two and three feet wide. That's why you feel like um, you need to cage them and stake them for that heaviness that, that the branches have. Um, let me back up a little bit. Uh, one of the goals of pruning would be to promote airflow and to bring in uh, more light to help ripen the tomatoes and also to prevent disease. Okay, my next slide. Okay, if you look at this uh, big green hot mess here, it, I mean, it looks really lush and, and um, but it does need some cleaning up there. A lot of that energy that that uh, tomato plant is putting out is, is instead of forming the fruit, which we all want, it's forming more and more leaves. So we need to go in there and clean that up. Uh, by pruning, um, and you'll be removing the uh, extra production. It'll be removing the extra growth. It's um, good for overall health. It helps keep the size in check. It helps in keeping your plants manageable for your garden space. Not everyone would be able to have the whole entire backyard. 
You may just have a little four by four or a whiskey barrel or an old swimming pool or an old pot to put a tomato plant or two in. Also, if you prune down on the bottom, you can also put in some companion plants such as strawberries or herbs. And imagine, can you imagine if you had all that leafy growth at the bottom and you don't really see your strawberries or your herbs, let alone you're not gonna be able to see the tomatoes that's all in, inside. So when should you prune? You should uh, try to prune early in the season just to get started on that. Um, and so the little, little bit of pruning here and there throughout the growing season uh, would probably save you a lot of time and energy if you tried to prune everything at one time with that big green um, plants that I had shown earlier, like our example. There is a tip that I wanted to point out um, to prune on a dry day. If the plant is wet from whether it be uh, a rain or a raining, uh, you might bring in the, the disease into the fresh cut. Okay, what is a sucker? Well, if you look at this tomato plant here, you can see there in the forefront, you see your main stalk going up and down. And then to the left, you'll see a, a lateral, stem going and then there in the middle you'll see your sucker plant this uh right here this one here you would just take your um, either your pin your your finger and your thumb and pinch it off if it's not too big or you could take a set of clean pruners ones that you cleaned with alcohol rubbing alcohol and you can just go down as far or as close to the stalk, the main stalk, and just clip it off. Okay. So here's a, um, an example here. You cut. Okay, so I remember to clean off your shears or your, your clippers. Okay, as you're cutting, as, I, as you can see me on the bottom right, uh, you can clean up some of that bottom. That'll let the sunlight and the air in. But unfortunately, because more sunlight is, is on that plant, you may get a little bit of a sun scorch or a scald to that newly exposed foliage. That's usually normal. The next thing I'd like to talk about is, um, I had not ever heard of this before, so it's new to me. Instead of having the wire bulky cages, there's a way to uh, give your tomato plant support. And it's called the Florida Weave. And um, here's an example. You take your two stakes, you have about three or four or five tomato plants staggered in between two of your stakes. Then you're going to take twine and uh, you're gonna weave this twine from one end of the stake to the other one, going in and out, staying as close as you can to the plant and going just in and out and in and out and then go back and repeat it going the opposite direction. When you get to the last stake, you're gonna loop that twine around the stake in a figure eight. Uh, you don't wanna to pull too tightly. You'll break off some of the branches and the stems or damage your tomatoes. And you're gonna continue weaving back to the other side in between and tie it off with a few knots. Then as your plants grow, you can repeat this in layers. You could have two or three of these uh, spaced um, as the diagram had shown. Okay. So 
So I'm eager to start that out. And here's a, a photo of, a, unfortunately, a failed attempt. The person, if you look, the yellow twine is um, just interspersed through the plants and there's a lot of foliage that's not really being supported. Uh, I believe they got a late start on this and, uh, but, you know, give them points for starting and trying something new. Okay. Um, I would like to thank you for your time and uh, your interest in this program. I would open it up for any questions. Okay, Ken, do you, are you available if anybody else has any more questions? Yep, I'm still here. Okay. Oh, I'm sorry. Let me see here if we have anything in the chat box real quick while we were listening to Kathy. Let's see. Um, there is a recommendation from Jerry to see uh, a Craig Lehauer's North Project. Um, it says he now has 136 different varieties of tomatoes. That's a lot of tomatoes. And right now, I don't see any further questions. Uh, if anyone has any further questions for Kathy about suckers or Ken, do you have any more to um, add on about the suckers ID or in a good way for them to identify where to do that, the, to remove the suckers? No, I think she covered it um, pretty well. Yeah, just basically where that uh, the the stem and the the main stem and the the leaf of the the stem coming off of it, and that you have that ninety degree angle there. If there's anything in between that, that's going to be your sucker that you want to remove potentially. Okay. And I'll say I'm, I'm trying Florida weave. I'm trying to <laughs> trying Florida weave this year, basket weave. Um, so yeah, that's, that's the first time I've tried it. Yeah, so far so good. I'm using a T post for mine since. Lumber was so expensive this year. It was cheaper to buy T posts than I get steak and stuff for it. Absolutely. Uh, May, May did ask Do you actually remove every sucker or leave some to shade the fruit? So, the last few years we've done, we've um, staked our tomatoes in my house and I've pruned off pretty much every um, sucker. So, I just have one kind of long skinny vine and I didn't have I uh, there's I mean there's still a decent amount of foliage on there I didn't have really any issues with um sun skull or anything I, I think part of it is because they were kind of the fruit was always kind of developing with that that full sun on there it wasn't kind of a real sudden thing um at least that's why I think it, I didn't get too much but yeah I've done it where, where I've pruned off basically every sucker mm -hmm. um kind of the issue with if you're staking and you're not pruning off those suckers is you know those really aren't going to be supported by those stakes because they'll, they'll kind of go off it at weird angles you kind of have to tie them back and and then you get you know everything kind of clumped real close together if you're trying to tie them onto a single stake you can put another stake out there um and kind of v it um v your your that new sucker that's going to cause create that new vine um so if you want to put multiple stakes out there you could you could try doing it if you're staking if you're um Caging them, you know, st uh, removing suckers doesn't become quite as important because you've got them contained in that cage and supporting those plants that way. Okay, I can remember times when I've not pruned my tomato plants and um, you're reaching in almost becoming a contortionist just to try to get the tomatoes that's inside because you're fighting the all the suckers and all the excess of growth of the tomato plant. Yeah, and when you get real dense foliage like that, it stays nice and wet and humid in there. Yes. Um, and that's that's a lot of times a recipe for, for disease. 
That's right. Usually when I get those tomatoes, I think I'm going to have, um, they're, you know, they're nice sized tomatoes and usually they have some sort of deformity or your thumb goes into the bad spot as you're picking it. It's very disappointing. <laughs> yes, it is. <laughs> okay. All right. But, and everybody's saying thank you. Um, both excellent guides to better tomato production and healthy plants. Thank you, May. And uh, a lot of great thank yous from um, some of your other participants So and Susan. So thank you very much, both of you, for your time tonight. Uh, we appreciate it. And we will be recording uh, and posting this to our YouTube channel. Everyone who has registered will receive the, again, your handouts from Ken I sent earlier, but you will get a link to the presentation. So thank you, Ken and, and Kathy for your time tonight. We appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you for having me and thank you everybody for, for listening to us. Thank you.